this is the this is the cyber tuner class. I'm Carl Lieberman from Los Angeles, and Dean Rayburn from uh, Michigan. Yeah, and and of course Dean is the creator of Cyber Tuner. So no one knows more than than Carl's the man the we have here. That's what we. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you look, in, I think it's in the in the, in the um, it's in the credits. credits. Um, uh, Carl, he comes up with a lot of ideas, and it's 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 amazing. Sometimes I come up with the ideas, some he does. We bounce them off each other. So, uh. <clears throat> so a question for you: How many people in this room use CyberTuner? How many people in this room do not use CyberTuner? Okay, and the two of you, do you use a different ETD? I have two left. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Is there anyone in the room who's an oral only tuner? Does not use an ETD at all. Oh, no. Okay, so so what I would say, mostly what we're going to talk about is about CyberTuner and and things that are unique to CyberTuner. Some of what we're going to talk about is actually tuning theory and stuff, and it should be applicable to everyone. You guys who are using TuneLab, even if you were oral tuners, I think there's some deep tuning theory that I think is useful. But mostly we're going to be talking about what CyberTuner does and why it does it. And you'll compare that to what TuneLab does and what, why TuneLab does it. Um, the first thing I think we should talk about, and, and uh, well, I'll, I'll do it today. The first thing we should talk about is iOS resources. You know, uh, we're running on iOS devices. This is a very, we, we take the sound when it's raw and we slice and dice it a million ways. And we really are, are doing the most to process the signal. And we use a lot of resources. And there may come times when all of a sudden you say, God, my, my phone is running slow. My cyber tuner is running slow. How come it's doing this? There's one reason and one reason only. There's too many programs running at the same time on your device. And they all want resources. So the right thing to do is to quit everything else that's running. Okay? And uh, Dean, you've got the iPad. You want to show people how to, how to quit. Yep. When you leave a program, you haven't quit the program. Even if you turn the machine off, if you power it off and power it on, you haven't quit the program. It'll come back on when the machine comes back on. So older older devices, if you use devices 10, 20 years ago, the, all, all, the solution for it not working right was to just power it off and power it on and reset it and everything's clean. That doesn't work with iOS devices because it remembers which apps you have open and it opens all 10 two or four or 20 or 500 apps that you had open when you, before you reset it. So um, you don't, you rarely ever need, occasionally but rarely ever need to actually power these off. Um, this little home button down at the bottom is not a power off button, it's not a quit button, it is, it's just a sleep button for each app and it's a power button. And the power off is not, a, is not a power off button, it's actually just a sleep button. So the way to power, to, the way to clean things up and to get CyberTuner so it has enough resources to do its job properly uh, is to exit all the other apps. Um, on a, if, it had, if, you're, if your device has a, has a home button, then double tap the home button and you can see all the apps that are running. Stand, move away from, let them see, yeah. yeah. So to exit all these apps, all you need to do is just swipe up on them. All these apps are running, mail, uh, test, all kinds of apps. And I would even, I would even uh, go and, and exit CyberTuner and then start it again. Now we only have one app open, and only one app's gonna use the resources, okay? Those other apps use a little bit of memory because they're set and they're dead in the water in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the machine, but they're not using any memory, they're not using any CPU time. We're, got, we're, we're ready to go. <clears throat> and so I'd like to say, I, you know, one of the nice things about CyberTuner is it'll run on up to 10 of your devices. Five. And five, five of your devices, and you want to always have a backup with you. I have my phone in my pocket. I have CyberTuner on my phone. It's my backup. I always have it. If, uh, if a, a version is out of print and I need to uh, update it, I am connected to the LTE network. I use an iPod Touch to tune. Most of our users use iPad minis to tune. That's the most popular platform. But whatever platform you use, it's really good if it's just your dedicated tuning platform. There's no other apps that are running on it. You're just running CyberTuner. You're never going to have any problems. I think that that's the easiest way to go. I just use my iPod my iPod Touch to tune, and I don't use it for anything else. It's always in my pocket. That's your own choice. If you want to run on your phone, of course you can. The phone, we're set up, a phone call comes in, it won't disrupt you. A text comes in, it won't disrupt you. But I like to have 
a backup on me all the time. Good question. Is there any variation of microphone across the platform? I think that there is, actually. I actually uh, used my iPad mini to sample this piano yesterday, and I used my iPhone 11 today. And I got lower variances with the iPhone 11, which is, you know, the iPad mini I have is maybe five years old. This is uh, 18 months old. I think the hardware is a little better on the newer devices. I got, I got, my variances were all 0 0.03, 0 0.04 today. So what and, Carl's saying is the best way to tell. If your microphone's working really well in Chameleon, you'll get really good samples. In other words, your variance numbers um, right here are going to be really low. They're going to be green and they're going to be really low. So don't, don't um, obsess too much if they're, as long as they're green, they're good. But if you get close and in, in, in one device consistently on every piano, gets high variances and the other one gets lower variances. That's right? from yesterday. That's not, oh, that's when you sampled yesterday. Okay, yes. Yes, yesterday's yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's this piano, but yesterday's. Right. And, so. and, and let me just say something, since we're looking at this, for the two of you don't realize this, everyone else does. The way we create a tuning in CyberTuner is we sample the five A's and we play them three times. And we wanna, we're gonna base all of our tuning based on these five notes that we've sampled on each piano. We want our samples to be good. And the way we do that is we take the three samples, we lay them over, and we look at the four different partials in each sample that we've made. What's the worst pair of samples? And when you see notes like that, when it says 0.03, on A1, it sampled the fourth, sixth, seventh, and 10th partials. And when you laid all three of the samples, all of the three tens, all of the three sevens, all of the three sixes, all of the three fours, the worst variation between any of those was 0.03 cents. It's virtually nothing, okay? It's plus or minus 0.0015 cents. Having low numbers means that you've got good samples. It also means something else. When you have low numbers, it also means that the piano is well prepped. Lots of times you'll have a note, you'll have an older pia funky piano. You can almost hear that there's something weird in the note, but you'll get 0.34 and you can't get any better than 0.34. That's because the boundary conditions are not good. You may have a loose bridge pin. You may have a, a misshaped V bar. The, the more solid that the boundary conditions are, the more well prepped the piano is, the lower variance numbers you're going to get. It's kind of a tip off. But what Dean said, it's very important. Once they're green, in other words, they're point not, point 0.19 or below, point, point 0.20 means plus or minus point 0.1. We're beyond the limit of human hearing. Our samples are so good. Don't waste your time. Don't, don't look at this and say, oh, I'm going to make that 0.19, a 0.09. I'm going to make it even better. It will have zero effect on the calculations. Once you've got five green samples, there's, you don't need to waste your time doing any better. So, and, and let me talk about one other thing, and then I'll, we'll, we'll kind of go to the meat and potatoes, because most of you guys are using this. The, the main thing I want to talk about, we have... CyberTuner has two features, and Dean has now created a third one that we'll talk about next. But it has two features that are the killer features, and it's what distinguish us from everyone else. All the other professional tuning programs, uh, TuneLab, VeraTuner, AccuTuner, are very good programs. They do a very good job. I think there's some things that we do just a little bit better. And the two things are, we don't tune the notes where we want them to end up. We use what we call smart tune mode, which is a pitch correction mode. And we use it if the piano is five cents off or if the piano is 25 cents off. We're not tuning the notes to where we want them to be. We're tuning them to some imaginary place that after you've tuned all the notes, they settle to exactly where you want them to be. Okay, that's what we're doing. So you can't really be running oral checks while you're tuning. You've got to let everything settle and then you can do your oral checks. Okay, so that's number one, is we're not tuning the notes to where we want them to be. And number two, our default tuning. We've gone through many different iterations in the 25 years that CyberTuner has been out there and how we calculate our tunings. We are now big believers in pure 12 tuning. And I want to give you, I want to tell you what pure 12 tuning is <coughs> and why I think it's so fantastic. Everyone knows about equal temperament. You know, it, it was first noticed by Pythagoras. 
500 BC. It was named in 300 BC by Archimedes. The Chinese found it in 100 AD. What people found is if they took a vibrating string and they cut it in half or they cut it in thirds or they cut it in fourths and they listened to the ratios, the fifths didn't line up with the octaves. You could have good octaves or good fifths, but you couldn't have both. The way we'd say that in piano terms is if I tuned seven pure octaves from C1 to C8 and doubled the frequency each time, I'd get a value. And if I tuned 12 pure fifths from C1 to C8, which is a three to two ratio, and took it to the 12th power, I'd get something different. And what I would end up if I tuned pure fifths compared to pure octaves, it would end up 23.46 cents sharper by tuning the fifths. That is the comma of Pythagoras. What, what tuning has meant for 2,000 years is taking these 23.46 cents and distributing them over the whole keyboard in the most seamless way. So for years we had mean tone tuning or just tone tuning or Pythagorean tuning. That was the best, that was the best that they could do. And then a couple of hundred years ago, we started to move to equal temperament tuning. And equal temperament lets you modulate. There's lots of advantages to equal temperament. Your intervals aren't quite as pure, but there's advantages, okay? One of the things that um, has happened, what equal temperament has meant for these last 200 years is pure octaves and tempered fifths. We have the 12 fifths. We have 23.46 cents. We temper all of our fifths, 1.96 cents. So equal temperament means you tune pure octaves and you temper your fifths. Thought experiment. What if we had pure fifths and we tempered our octaves? We have seven octaves into that 23.46 cents. It would be 3.35 cents wide. That's a very wide octave. You'd have pure fifths, but you'd have octaves screaming at you. No one would like it. You frequently hear people say, oh, I do pure fifth tuning. Well, they think they do, but they're not. Because if you did pure fifth tuning, the octaves would sound so terrible, no one would like it. But here's, here's the thing. We now have the ability to do something that we've <laughs> never had the ability to do. What if we split the difference? What if we say we're going to put half the error on the fifth, and we're going to put half the error on the octave. So now we have seven octaves, 12 fifths, 19 intervals. We're spreading the 23.46 cents. We're tempering our fifths by 1.23 cents, and we're expanding our octaves by 1.23 cents, okay? The octaves are just a little bit wide. The fifths are a little bit cleaner. So that's good. All of that's nice, but it gets even better. What if I take the C4, G4 fifth, which is contracted by 1.23 cents. And I stack on top of it the G4, G5 octave, which is expanded by 1.23 cents. And I look at the C4, G5 twelfth. It's going to be zero. Minus 1.23 and plus 1.23. I'm going to have a pure twelfth. Well, how nice are pure twelfths? Pure twelfths are in the first position of every chord, major, minor. You're playing twelfths all the time on the piano. So to have pure twelfths, you've cleaned up a lot of harmonic chatter. But it gets better. You've got the octaves beating at 1.23 cents. You've got the fifths beating at 1.23 cents. They're both beating at the same rate. The background chatter that you're hearing of octaves beating and a fifths beating, it's the same beat rate. And they go in and out of phase. Sometimes they cancel each other and the beat disappears. Sometimes they summate and the beat is, is louder. But it's only one beat rate. And all of the then beat rates that are derivative to that are derivative to this one beat rate. It just means there's a lot less harmonic chatter and a harmonic chafing in the background when you do pure 12th tunings. For me, that's the argument for pure 12th tuning. It just, people have wanted to do this for 2,000 years. They just didn't know how to do it. We've actually figured it out. We now know how to do it. We've got modern computers. We don't do it in a slavish way. Dean is, is very clever with the way he, we don't just do three one twelfths. 
And everywhere we go, we measure the three, we measure the one, we tune three one twelfths. It's more complicated. Just like fifths are not just three two fifths, they're also six four fifths. There's a couple of things going on. There's not only three one twelfths, there's six two twelfths. So we're taking all of this into account. We're ever so slightly bending our fifths because we're also listening to thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, tenths, twelfths. We're trying to compromise everything. But that's the argument for pure 12 tuning. I'll let you, yeah. Um, shall we uh, get on to our? Um... I would go straight to AI at this okay. point. So we, we have a new feature coming out in the fourth quarter of this year, sometime September, October, probably. Um, it's, we call it uh, AI mode. Um, I, I call it oral intervals mode. Uh, Carl Artificial calls it, intelligence. Carl, Carl calls it something else. You can call it either one. Um, it's a very, very smart mode. Um, and um, but you, all of your experience and all the tools you have in CyberTuner still work just fine and are still very usable. We still use Chameleon for the first pass. Um, we're going to calculate a Chameleon tuning, and then we're going to go to CyberEar and to turn on the AI mode. We're going to go. Um, we're, we have a new button called AI mode right here next to Concert mode. And oh, I've, got a, I've got a pointer that's going to work better than that. Yeah. Turn on concert mode, too. Um, turn sure. them both on. Yeah. You can turn them on both at the same time. Concert mode just affects how fast your spinner and, and how wide the spinner moves. Um, once you turn on AI mode, you've got a calculate button. Uh, but we've got to take some extra samples. AI mode wants to have uh, more information from the piano. And we've developed some methods to quickly get um, a lot more information out of the middle of the piano, especially across the break. The challenging part on pianos is tuning across the bass treble break is the, is the big is the part where it's difficult to predict for cyber tuner and difficult to tune for oral tuners. So, so what do we do across the break? Um, we're going to take, and I'll show you a few in a few minutes. We'll do a new one. We're going to take samples across uh, 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 25 notes. Actually, cyber tuner already puts in three samples for you for free from Chameleon, A2, A3, A4. So we got, we've got something to start with. Um, let's, let's go calculate a note one in Chameleon so we have something to start with. Once they're all green, it doesn't let you resample. It thinks you, doesn't, you don't want to resample them again. Um, so we've, we're going to calculate, hit tune. Um, I'm just going to label this one example. So just FYI, I, I strip muted the middle of the piano. I came in here and I tuned to OTSP. I sampled this piano. I did an OTSP tuning. I then went in and I let AI do its thing. And it runs through 50, 60, 70 iterations in a billionth of a second, optimizing all of the notes, balancing every interval, looking at it and trying to make the perfect tuning. So then we did that. Then I retuned these notes to what AI wanted. So what you're listening to is kind of like the basic tuning that we would now create for this piano. But first, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm okay. Actually, show them how it samples. The sampling um, to sample actually about 22 notes takes about five or six minutes. It's a little bit faster, a little smarter sampling than Chameleon does. Um, it doesn't need quite as much data, so we can do it a little bit faster. Um, we've already get three sample, three green samples for free. They're imported from Chameleon, and. I'm just going to pull it, pull it up there. Oh, please set it to plus 4.3 cents. Set it to plus 4.3 cents. Oh, yeah, let's go. Up. Let's go set it to plus. A, a is a oh a 441. No, 4.3 cents. Okay, you want you wanted a specific 4.3. Okay. You all know how to do that. You know how to globally change pitch. You know, if, if a piano is two cents sharp, don't tune it to A440. Tune it to two cents sharp. Oops. Okay, so we're, what you want to watch is right here. There's going to be a ring forming right there. It's, it's a little bit subtle. There's already a green ring there. Um, but when I play the note, it's going to sample this piano. sample. It thinks we, we might want to do this again later. 
You can actually sample while you're doing the final pass, as long as there's only one spring open, or if the unisons are really close. So you can save a little time there. But it does want me, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through and sample all the notes, because it's just going to take a little time to do that. You're usually going to get a green sample as long as you're not talking over it or making lots of noise. Um, you're going to get good green samples pretty quickly. So let's let's go back in and um, let's say I've sampled all these notes for this piano. We're going to go back and this is the tuning that we, Carl. Um, how many? Do you remember how many um, bad samples you got? That you had to resample? None, huh? zero. Because I used up on my phone. The mic is better, okay. and I had none that I had to resample. And, and nobody was in the room, and it was fun. And by the way. For all of you, you need to know where the mic is on your device. Like this is an iPhone. The mic is at the bottom because you talk into it like a phone. So if you sample a piano with the phone, you got to point the bottom of your phone at the notes. If it's an iPod or an iPad, the mic is at the top. You've got to point the top of the device. If you want to get good, clean samples, point the mic at the notes that you're sampling, yeah. but you got to know, and you can go online, just put the, put, where is my mic and put in your device and it'll show you a picture of where the mic is on your device. Mm -hmm. And another trip to get good samples, whether it's in chameleon or it's in AI mode, it's coming up. Um, CyberTuner uses the mic, just like you use your ears when you're listening. If you're sitting on the piano bench and you can't hear, what do most, what do most tuners do if they can't, if they have trouble hearing, they move their head around or they scoot themselves up and down the bench. That's because you get there can be a place where there's standing waves where you just can't hear it quite perfectly. Um, if you can get farther away from the piano, sometimes it'll be better. Um, putting the mic really close to the piano isn't necessarily better. Playing louder isn't necessarily better. Playing quieter, getting it farther away. So the the, the secret is move the mic. So a lot of times, move it farther away from the note is is, uh, is the answer. Sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's playing softer. Well, especially in the top octave, if you're not getting a clear pattern, you know, move the mic, move it up real close so it's pointed at those notes, and sometimes pluck the strings with your fingernail or a credit card or a guitar pick or something, you'll get a clearer tone, you, you know, it'll read easier. And me personally, you know, I tune all my unisons by ear. I, I, I like to tune the unisons by ear, but the upper half dozen notes on the piano these days, I tune each string to the machine and I'm getting, I think, cleaner unisons that I can get by ear. So next step is assuming we did all 22 samples out of 25, three, three, with three, three Bs, we got 25 notes sampled and we're going to tap the tuning mode button. We're going to tap AI Calculate. Um, then it's going to give us a bunch of information about the tuning. Um, it's uh, which, what note was the worst? That's an excellent variance. Um, which note? This is the most interesting one to me. Uh, what's the, it does a number of iterations. Well, which is the first note that it found immediately was, was, was off? Um, I, what, I, what I do is go back and I listen orally. I find out whether I agree with that. Does my ear say, yep, that note was, was flat. It needed to go point. I should have a plus there. It needs to go plus 8.88 cents, almost a cent sharper. <clears throat> so you can actually teach yourself oral tuning if you know the intervals. And CyberTuner will essentially teach you oral tuning. Um, so what the, the system we use to perfect the tuning is um, CyberTuner goes through and, and it knows all the, all the partial ladders and it matches up this virtual um, uh, interval tuning and it finds the worst uh, note with where all the intervals point to. That note needs to be corrected the most and it corrects that note, number one. Number two, it goes through the whole sequence again and checks every other note. So essentially it's going through a temperament sequence and it does it iteratively. So I, and I tell, I program it to do uh, it, and the number of iterations that it needs to do until the, it can't find any any balance better th that it can improve more than 0.1 cents. And that's what it did. In this case, it did 30 37 cents. iterations. It did 37 iterations for this piano, which is about average, a little on the low side. Uh, it's a pretty good piano. Uh, chameleon, it's it kind of an indication of how good the chameleon tuning was, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, well, listen, you know, this is a GC1, which is the successor to a GH1. 
And this is not some special new Yamaha. This is one of the hotel's pianos that they just dragged in here. You've all worked on GH1s. They're one of the hardest pianos to tune. Going across the break is monstrous. This is the Yamaha's updated... This is a phenomenally well-designed piano. When you listen to the intervals orally uh, that that cyber tuner picked for the tuning on this piano, it's not like a GH1 or you know what you what I thought a GC1 was going to be. It's really a spectacularly well-balanced tuning. And we're going to look at that in a minute. We're going to look at the difference between the stock chameleon tuning right out of the box Question. and the and the AI tuning. I yeah. was going to ask real quick, is the value of the oral iterations uh, conducive or an indication of the scale of the camera? Uh, yeah, actually, if it, um, I've got a, I'll show you in a minute. I've got a, um, a Kimball console, and it went through all 111 iterations. This still couldn't quite get it perfect. Surprise? No, not, not surprise. <laughs> couldn't quite get it down to uh, a perfect balance, but close. It was real close. So, um, either you can either hit tune or graph, but it's already calculated. Uh, and we're going to look at the graph. So the, the black dots, I like seeing it in the dot mode. Some people like to see it in the in the other mode, but I want to see every individual dot. So the black dots are the uh, out-of-the-box chameleon tuning that are calculated with nice smooth turn curves that you're used to seeing. Um, the green dots are the AI mode modified. Um, and my laser pointer is a little finicky here. Um, <clears throat> so the, the most significant, the first thing I look at with the AI mode is uh, which notes are the most outlying and, and especially down here across the break. And I'm, I'm seeing it lowered these notes. This is probably the most uh, modified note right here, uh, A, A sharp, B. So B is probably the most modified. Note. It was, it was 0.88. The note that was, that was changed the most was, was B, 0.88 cents. Right. Low, it lowered, we lowered it 0.88 cents. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to that, but I'm gonna listen right across that area of the piano. But, I've put the AI tuning on the piano now. This isn't yeah. the original tuning. This is the AI tuning. Right. So we can't. Uh, we, I wish I could AB it, but it's, it's really difficult to do that. So we're just going to listen to the AI tuning. It cleaned it up. What it did is lowered those notes on the on the on the bottom and there. raised the top notes on right. that in yeah. that area. So um, what AI what AI wants to hear down here is contiguous thirds, contiguous fourths, tenths. Uh, parallel tw tenths and a twelfth up. It wants to make sure those intervals are all smooth. That's currently. Currently is uses an equal balance of those. We're working on the balance between the intervals. But let's just listen to it. I'm pretty happy with that, but I hear just a little tiny bit of... of So what I hear is this, This I would, I would like that to be just a hair faster, maybe. I mean, it's not a big deal, but, but so, but listen, so that means it ought to go down. The lower note ought to go down. Can we do that? So let's listen to the contiguous fourths. Th these should be uh, four to five ratio. This, if, if we have a uh, four, four time for this note, It should be five for this, but it's not. It's something like four to four, five and a half or four to six. Can we all hear that? You probably hear it better than I can in the back of the room. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's almost four to six. So that that's saying that that wants to go up. That don't wants to go up. Basically, I've got a good balance then. Those are the two primary intervals that the one, two of the four primary, primary intervals the program is trying to balance. One of them wants to, is telling me to make it sharper. One's trying to make it flatter, and it's a very subtle amount in either in either case. So it is a good balance. The program is not trying to make a perfect tuning. It's trying to make a balanced tuning where all the intervals are, are balanced, so they all sound good. And and look at what it did. If you look at where the five is. In other words, in that octave, A2 to A3, it kind of steepened the curve. It dropped the bottom down a little, and it raised the top up a little. It wanted it to, it, it wanted it to act like it had a little bit more inharmonicity in it.
which it probably does, then it measured, then it actually measured, but it's treating it as if it had a little bit more inharmonicity, and that's the right thing to do. But we're going to look, the other thing you can learn from looking at this improvement, and it is, I think if I, I've checked a number of pianos now orally, and, the, and it, is a, it is a significant improvement, but sometimes it's subtle. Look at that, the difference, the worst, the most, the greatest difference between the chameleon tuning and the uh, AI tuning is, is a, a 0.8 cents right here. And most of these are 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, same thing right up in here. And there are a slight difference, in, in a very smooth difference. What that's telling me is um, this is a really small difference between, this is a really well-scaled piano. This piano uh, is well-made and was really... Uh, Predictable. Uh, it was well-sampled, it's really well-scaled, and it's really predictably scaled. And I might, I might, I might tune, retune it to the AI tuning, I might not. But is anybody going to hear this? Probably nobody but a piano tuner is going to hear the difference here, or a really, really good ear. Um, it, it's a very small. Is, so is, is the difference small or large on other pianos? It varies. If the, if the piano has a really challenging scale, let's look at a couple pianos that have challenging scales. Unfortunately, they gave us a really good piano. I kind of wish they'd given us a bad piano. We thought it was a bad piano. We thought, oh, this is going to be cool. It's going to be a turkey. Yeah, but it's not. Small brands are, are very challenging across the break, but Yamaha did a great job on this. If they'd have given us a GH1, it would have been great. <laughs> that would have been so much fun. So we're going to look around at... Um, okay, this is a piano that my son Nate tuned last week, uh, Thursday or Friday. And then he sent me, he emailed me the tuning. This is actually at our church that we both go to. Uh, it's a G157, really challenging break. Um, the inharmonicity is kind of all over the place. We, he and I always, he and I alternate tuning it, whoever has enough time. And, and um, we're always challenged by getting it as good as we can. So this, when he sent it to me, I asked him, well, did you have enough? Oh, look at this note. Wow, that's like two and a half cents, the program. Uh, push that note up two and a half cents. So he, he didn't have time to verify it. He said, well, you can go back on Sunday. So after church on Sunday, I went in and verified it by ear. And what I found was, it that that's A sharp. It's the highest note. It's a 26 bass, so it's the highest note on the on the bass bridge. Um, the thirds and fourths and fifths sounded perfect all the way across that area of the piano. The tenths, it, I, I would have loved for the, the tenth was a little slow. I would have loved for that note to gone down just a hair from the tenths. So that's, we've had a number of pianos now where our, our, uh, we're going to be pushing, uh, we're going to be weighting the tenth a little heavier in this part of the piano. And that's what we're finding. So, but it was a big improvement. This piano basically sounded better than, than here I had ever heard it. I've, I've never heard it sound nice like that. Um, I didn't get, I didn't have enough time to listen to these two, but they're so subtle. This is only a half a cent right there difference. I don't know if I, I could just barely hear it if I, if I worked at it. But that outlier there, was a significant improvement. And that's, this is what we're looking for here. And, and if I was going to say, um, all of you who are using OTSP and are listening to your tunings, one of the things that I've just noticed, I love OTSP, I very rarely change anything. But when I listen to it orally in a critical mode, I think that the two highest bass notes and the, let's say, the four lowest tenor notes are a little hair too sharp. I'd like to push them down a little. And when I have the, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I get to follow some of the Japanese master tuner, tuners, Yoshi Kusakabi or people like that. And I noticed that our cyber tuner tuning and, and his oral tuning are virtually the same. But on the top of the bass and the bottom of the tenor, he stretches a little bit more by ear than we are. And I, you know, guys at that level, I, I take what he does very seriously because I think he's tuning about as well as anyone can tune. And we're now finding as we're doing this artificial intelligence mode that we need to just push down the bottom of the tenor and the top of the bass a hair. I don't know if any, has anyone noticed this when they listen to their OTSP tunings? Am I? It's, it's, that's usual, but I'm, I'm finding in, in, in there's a few cases where it's down. So. Yes, sometimes it's different. But that's been my normal, as I've been trying to evaluate, what do I think about OTSP? I basically love it. But if I were going to make a criticism, that would be my, my criticism. Yeah. So this is Carl's piano. Carl tuned this. And the first thing I asked him is, well, what did this, what did this note sound like? Uh, 
So, and Carl didn't get enough chance. I was too sick to, to when I when I did listen, this. Uh, this is a Hamburg Steinway Model F. So it's a it's a nice piano, but it's a it's the forty one inch console, the Hamburg version of it. It's got wound strings on the first four notes of the tenor. And, and it's thick, you know, got number 22 wire for the first, you know, 22, 21, 20. It's, it's I mean, it, the piano stays in tune. I, I tune it once a year, whether it needs it or not. And it stays in tune. It was 100% at A440 when I got to it. But, but I didn't get to really listen to it. So I don't know if this is, that's a huge discrepancy there. It's, it's, like, um, it's telling me something's weird. I know that this piano is weird across the break, but I didn't realize it was that weird across yeah. the Break. It's like a four or five cent change, so that needs to be verified. And that's what we're working on over the next month or two. Uh, we have about 20 beta testers, um, five or six of them are CTEs, and the rest of them all have good ears. We're all orally verifying everything to make sure it's working correctly. So um, there's really no other way to, to tell if this is doing the right thing. I can calculate something in an ivory tower, and does it really work is the real question. <clears throat> and the answer is mostly yes. Uh, this one is uh, one of our, and I didn't get a report whether this how this sounded either. This is a Kimball console. This is the one that took all 111 iterations, and it still didn't quite get it down to 0.1 cents uh, balance. But look at those notes. You see those three dots, the three green dots. If you remember the Kimball console, it has like four or five wound pairs in the tenor section, and above that, it has three pairs of steel strings it's so it's got like eight notes of of two string unisons in the middle of your temperament and only and some of them are copper and some of them are steel it's probably you know the kimball console it's up there with the whitney spin it as the as the worst piano made you know it's it, it's a neck and neck but so you can see that it, it really wants to do something on that piano so the question comes where would you use this feature well um, you can you can kind of verify whether a chameleon is doing a really good calculation for that particular piano, and you may want to go back and retune the middle, or or and it spreads the tuning out from the middle. Um, you may you may decide that it, it's you know only a few tenths of a cent difference, and just leave the tuning just like it is. Um, on a, if, it depends on the customer, it depends on the situation. It's really up to you how you use this tool. Question. Uh, with any what? Yes, this yeah. is fitting in the rubric these, of perfect twelfths. All these tunings are modified per, modifying the perfect twelfths tuning. Yeah, yep. Is that, is that what OTSP is? Yep, that's what it is. It's pure, the perfect twelfth uh, tuning. Yeah, OTSP is just our shorthand for pure twelfths. Yep. So if I did smart tune mode, <clears throat> no TSP, could I also use the concert mode all at the same time? You can use all of them at the same time. Yep. Ward. So you said you might choose to just leave it. Does that mean? You tune it through first to a side tune mode, then go check it and look at it and see if you want to retune that. That's what I would do because it needs to. The piano needs to be really close to do the spine of a of a job. The piano needs to be to make take these samples. It needs to be within you know two or three cents of of final tuning. Um, if, if it's ten or twenty cents off, you're really not close enough to take these samples because the inharmonicity is going to change enough to change this. Well, let, let me say something. This is me personally. Some of you might say I'm being too sloppy. You know, I virtually never correct an OTSP tuning, okay? Uh, it's not that it's not possible to correct them, but I don't think it's significant. I think what really matters, we're doing such a good tuning, nobody can hear this level of fine adjustments. It's not worth my time. It's worth spending my time on my unisons. I spend all, most of my time on trying to have as good clean unisons as I can. That's where the bang for the buck is, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think that um, that graph is showing that, especially if it's a decent piano, it's reasonable uh, in our ministry and, and reasonably predictable like this piano. Um, that's exactly what I'm saying here. Even in the middle, or it's doing that many, many iterations. This is a very, very small um, change. So, um, I mean, it's, yes, it's lowering the curve just a little bit down there, but that's, I mean, you can see the difference there, but can you hear it? It would be very subtle. So it'd, be, it'd, be hard to, it'd be hard to detect that difference. So, and, on this and piano. another thing in the real world, you know, I'm tuning pianos in the real world to make real dollars, not 
Ethereum dollars, you know, and I, I want to be fast. I want to go through and, and, and do things like that. So when a piano is within 20 cents, I'm doing one pass tunings. I'm using concert smart tune and I'm tuning it in one pass. And you know what? I go back and I clean up five unisons and it's close enough. You could, you know, if, if someone were treating it as an exam tuning, you could make corrections. But I don't think anyone hears the difference. I'm, I'm getting zero callbacks. No one says to me, God, how could you have left it like that? So I really think that within the 20 cent window, you can use smart tune, concert smart tune, tune it once, go over it a second time to clean up some unisons and go on your way. Don't waste your time trying to do the perfect tuning. In but I would argue if you tune, you're tuning a really important piano and you're going to be tuning this over and over, it only takes five or six minutes or so to take these samples save that tuning and the next time you could just the next time you come back to the piano use the ai mode calculator oh i'm going to do that on my concert and my recording studio pianos yeah. i'm going to now try and tweak the tuning and make this now my default tuning Absolutely. and that's another thing by the way some people say especially I, I work on a lot of pianos that i work on over and over again and you could make the argument for sampling them each time before you tune them I do not believe in that. I want to build stability into my pianos. So I want to use the same tuning over and over again. So when I've sampled the piano and gotten a good tuning and I've listened to it carefully and it sounds really good to me, that's my tuning for that piano. I don't resample it. I use the same tuning over and over and over again. Why don't we take a break here? Because normally, you know, we, we go through features and we'll talk about different common features. But what this is an opportunity is there anything that that's on your mind yes could you explain what's going on in the second octave or the last screen um that on this screen it's up at zero cents the third octave is down 10 to 15 cents on that oh oh yes because the, it's looking at the fifth partial the fifth partial is 12 and a half cents wide in other words that you know the third we're offsetting. The fifth partial is not stri strictly on the, on the curve. The same with the sixth partial, you see it's close to zero, the third, the second, the first. But the seventh partial is 33 cents flat. It's an enharmonic partial. The seventh partial uh, is not lining up with the seventh harmonic exactly. So that's why they're offset. The fifth partial and the seventh partial. The, the non, non um, I would say a different way, the non-octave partials are actually not on the keyboard. So CyberTuner is showing you the actual sense. Uh, if we were to eliminate that amount that is not on the keyboard, these are the curves that you get. You would get right there. You, we can offset them to zero, in other words. Let's just offset them up. Yeah, the, the, the way to think of it is the fifth partial involves a third, and thirds are uh, 13, about 13 cents uh, wide. So that's why it's 13 cents down. Okay. Um, the seventh partial is actually 31 cents off the keyboard, and that's why it's 31 cents low. So not exactly, but 31.7. With a stretch in it, starting and then stretching farther down. Yeah, it's just it's just the way that the harmonics work out. Uh, well, I'll ask you said the piano was two cents sharp. Just do it that way. How would you set up to do that? Well, you go to the global, go in chameleon, and at the top of chameleon, uh, at you see where it says A440? If you click that, there's a global pitch setting. You can either do it in hertz or in cents. Now, look, you know, I've tuned for thousands of recording sessions, okay? Real recording sessions, they're making records. And I let my pianos float basically from zero to plus four, okay? We don't have a humidity control on it. They're not a humidity controlled room. The pianos float between zero and four. Plus four I, cents. Four, four, four cents. Yeah, four. I have never in my life, in over 15 years of working in the studio every day, had someone say to me, the pitch is off. And these are lots of people who have, you know, electronic pitch things. No one cares if the piano is a couple of cents sharp. Nobody cares. People care if the piano is a couple of cents flat. And since lots of times I don't have a lot of time, either on a concert stage or in a recording studio, I've got to be fast. If the piano is all a little flat, I got to tune every note. I got to spend an hour and tune this piano. If, if it's two and a half cent sharp or 3.1 cent sharp, nobody cares. And I can just go in and tweak it in five or 10 minutes. And it's going to be more stable too than if you had to move it. So, so when you come across a piano, for a home piano, I would make my window even a little bit wider. 
Okay, you know, it's not A440. Think th this is one of the things I would say in oral tuning. You start by taking a tuning fork and setting your A. And then you do your temperament, and then you do your octaves, and then you have all the shape of your tuning. It's exactly, and then you, and then, and finally at the end, you pull out your temperament strip and you do your unisons. It's exactly the wrong way to tune, okay? It makes A440 the most important thing, and it makes your unisons and stability the least important. When we tune, we're tuning unisons as we go. We're stabilizing our unisons. And the pitch, the last thing is A4 ends up at plus 1.6 cents or plus 3.1 cents. It's kind of the least important thing. And so we get to it last. I think there's actually real advantages to digital tuning, doing unisons as you go, as compared to oral tuning with a temperament strip. Yes? Do you do uh, tunings recording studios? When the piano was part of the, uh, the ensemble. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I tune for orchestras that are doing film scores. And I tune for tr uh, trios or quartets or. Now, the question is this if some of the members of the ensemble uh, wins, how much. How well, I, I think I think you can adjust a, a wind instrument for three or four cents pretty easily. If it, you know, after all, most symphonies are tuning to A442 now, so they're adjusting eight cents for the symphony orchestra. Yes, you know, when it gets up to 443 or something like that, you're probably uh, pushing the envelope, and you're going to have people upset at you. Let me tell you something else I do. Dean, would you go to, in Chameleon and go to the high treble assist type of situation? And uh, right there, you can adjust just the high treble, okay? And when would you use something like this? In other words, the whole tuning is the same, but you decide to do something. Let's say I'm, I'm working on a, a Steinway D and I'm on a concert stage. And it turns out that C8 is at plus 54 cents, okay? I would usually say, great, that's the perfect place for it to be. It's at, it's at plus 54 cents. But let's say I'm working on the Steinway D and I'm in the recording studio. And it says to me I should be at plus 54 cents. I say to myself, you know, people are going to be playing with synthesizers. They're going to be playing with other instruments. And we might just be getting too much of a variation on these top notes. So I might take that slider, and I frequently do this in the studio, and I might move it to minus three. And that would bring it down C8 to be at 42 cents. Still plenty sharp, but I kind of think it'll blend with other instruments better. So I use that high treble slider to micro address. Also, if I'm tuning two pianos together, and we do, and you do the perfect tuning on each piano. But when you look at it, you, me, you have a Mason and Hamlin double A where C8 comes up to plus 34. And you have a uh, Steinway B where C8 comes up to plus 48. Well, I might play with that slider and kind of move those two things closer together up in the eighth octave. And so there just isn't as much discrepancy. The whole rest of the piano will be the same. Okay, you can use these tools and you can use it with your common sense as a piano technician. That's what you should be. You should be using your smarts. These tools serve you. You don't serve these tools. Can you show us the difference there with the uh, stock um, recording key? Yeah, take, take the recording okay. on that piano and, and move it to minus three. See what happens when you move it to minus three or you move it to plus three. Okay. I, I Calculate again. I'm going to call this one example two. So it'll be right next to the other one. That's a minus three. Yep. And you can see in the header it says P minus three. So it reminds you what you did. Well, let's go look at the let's go look at the two the two tunings, the graph of the two tunings. There's the first one we did with at zero, and here's the second one. So it changed the upper upper stretch just a little bit. I changed it about 10, 10, 10, 12 cents. Yeah, I changed it from like 42 or 3. 44. 44 to, yeah, to 36. Something like that. Yeah.
Well, we can look at the actual amount in chameleon. It looks like nine cents to change it. It's usually about three cents per number, sometimes four cents per number. But this is just something that you, if you want to kind of tweak these things, there are simple ways to tweak things to help yourself out. Yeah. Uh, can you show us how you decided to make the global adjustment? How you decided that two cents is and and look at where so this piano when I came to it it's all about 4.3 cents sharp so I didn't tune this piano to zero I tuned it all to 4.3 cents sharp and show us how you so I sampled the piano so look at the look at lo this, is not, this is not actually this piano I only, oh. the only, it's only the A2 that's this piano so when when I, I, I I'm, when I sampled this piano Okay, um, when I sampled this piano, I blind as a bat without my glasses. I had cataract surgery, and okay, it says four forty one point one. That's in other words four point three cents. That's where I sampled this piano. So I can I can look, and you can toggle toggle back between the one seventy three. See the blue one one point seventy three in chameleon. You can toggle back and forth between cents and hertz. Okay, it's a different piano. But I saw that globally. The whole piano was about 4.3 cents sharp. So I then went into I went into Chameleon, where it says A440.5 up at the top, and 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 I changed that to in cents. I went to plus 4.3. So, so so you you based that decision on the number you saw for the A4. Exactly, and it turns out. By the way, this is an interesting thing. Sometimes you'll ask yourself, what pitch is the piano at? Okay. If I only had one note to choose, I would choose A4. It turns out, in my experience, about 15 notes above the lowest tenor plain wound string, 12 to 15 notes, is actually the note that is actually at the global pitch of the piano. That's just, I've looked at thousands of pianos. That's the way it is. And that's close to A4. But remember, when you look at the, the pitch of, of A5 and everything, it's going to be up because it's stretched. And, this, and if you look at all the ones below, it's going to be down. So if I want to say to myself, what is the actual pitch level of the piano? A4 is a pretty good first approximation. Um, I'd get a better approximation in a lot of pianos I tune because they're just all over the place. Um, by just playing all the A's of the piano. It's about average. That, that, that four cents are so sharp is just about right. I'm not going to be changing a lot of notes um, by just playing all the A's of the piano. It's about average. That, that, that four cents are so sharp is just about right. I'm not going to be changing a lot of notes. Now, if that were, so if, if I had started at A440, Obviously, it's, it's going to be different. If I tune to that pitch, I'm going to be lowering every note. I don't want to be working that hard. I don't want to be destabilizing. So when, if I come to this piano and I see that with all the A's, uh, I'm going to, uh, I usually think in hertz, not cents. So I'm going to go up to A441 and um, try that again. A2. I never tuned A2. <laughs> oh, um, All right, I did tune A2. I did tune A2, yeah. Let's try it. What is that, Tubby? So A1's kind of an outlier. So I might have chosen four cents. Carl chose 4.3. We're within 3.3 .3 cents. We're, we, we're in complete agreement. That's, that's an insignificant amount. We both tune this to A441 or 4 cents or 4. But I, I encourage you in general, you know, I, I'm, I believe in A440. I pitch raise all pianos. I don't, I'm not sloppy. I don't leave pianos 10 cents flat ever. Okay. But I'm not fanatic about A440. In other words, if something, someone's home piano is at 439.5, it's 2 cents flat. And especially, it's two cents flat in the winter time when the heat is on and it's dry. 
Am I going to go and do a pitch raise on that piano for two cents? That's crazy. You're not, you're not doing anyone any favor by doing that. I, I, I like to say that stability is piano playability over time. You're trying to make the piano playable for as long. If, if it's every week at a jazz club, or if it's every year at someone's house, whatever the interval is, you're trying to make the piano stable. You don't have to be a slave to this machine that tells you it's 2.3 cents sharp. Oh, I got to do something. Because now we know, you know, all those years I worked as an oral tuner and I took my tuning fork. I mean, you don't even hear these differences. It never used to be significant. We now have more information than we really need. Don't be a slave to this information. Any other questions? Anyone? Yes. But the OTS levels, you know, one, two, three, eight. Stand out of the way. You're in. Go go in go into chameleon here. Yeah, those are still there if you want them. Yeah, I was just wondering more or less how to use them. Like I always use OTS four. Is there a place where you can use a lower <clears throat> number? Or okay, so if you if you had a Bosendorfer, let's say, or a Shiguru Kawaii, very low in harmonicity pianos, and you said to yourself, you know, I don't think OTSP is going to be the right approach to this piano. Okay, I, I, I will really want as little stretch as possible. You might go and use OTS 2 and put a really, really unstretched tuning on the piano. So let's pull that out. Um, let me give you the advice we used to give, and I'll, and I'll qualify it. Currently, our best advice is just use pure 12 things. It, it automatically adjusts for the piano. Um, the, essentially, our pure 12s tunes pure 12s in the middle five octaves. And it, uses, it, it treats the highest octave and lowest octave as special cases. In the middle five octaves, it's going to tune real pure twelfths, and it's going to compromise it a little bit so that your thirds, fourths, fifths, tenths, and such will, will not sound poor. They'll, they'll progress normally. Um, so it's not going to tune perfect pure, pure twelfths, shall we say. It's going to tune a little bit modified pure twelfths. In the top end of the piano, it's going to use um, six one instead of three one pure twelve, so it's going to use six one uh, intervals. Down here, it's going to going to go higher partials, and it's going to use uh, pure twelves. But instead of three one partial matching, it's going to use six two or even twelve four in the, in the really low bass on a big piano. So um, when I say it's, when we say it's pure twelves, it's a smart pure twelves. On on little tiny pianos, they can't take uh, a six one up here, so it's going to do just pure twelves all the way to the top. Okay, the program knows whether it's a pure, whether it's a small piano or a medium piano or a big piano. We have four different sized pianos, okay. and and CyberTuner knows on bigger pianos it does more stretch on the top and the bottom, and on just like it used to do in the old OTS style. There's a global stretch, and then there's an additional kick on the top and the bottom octaves based on how big the piano is. So that said, um, I would use pure twelves on practically any piano these days. But you're, there are cases where you might want to use our older classic, we call classic uh, tuning styles, where um, octave tuning style four is in the middle of the road. It's a moderate amount of octave stretch. Um, your, your octaves are slightly stretched. Your, your fifths are, sli are slightly near. It's kind of close to what most examiners would use on an exam. Um, it's close. Um, but you still have other tuning styles. For instance, if you're tuning a really low intermediate piano like the Kawaii and some Yamahas, you might want to tune active tuning style uh, two or three, two or three. I never do use one. Uh, it's just the octaves are too, too the, the fifths are just too noisy for me. One or two, the fifths are just too noisy. What I used to do on large pianos on the concert stage before we had pure twelfths, so I would tune. Um, a seven foot piano generally I would tune to five or six if it was a basically if it was a nine foot piano on a concert stage, I would push it up to octave tuning style six or seven. And that would be a lot of stretch, but a, a Stanley D in a concert stage can take that. It'll take that stretch just fine. And it's actually fairly close to the pure twelfths. Um, not very far off from the pure twelfths. It's just not quite as even as pure twelfths. Right. And the that's thing about pure twelfths is it gives you a measuring stick and it gives you an objective measuring stick that you can apply and the whole middle five octaves of the piano, and, and do the, essentially the same amount of stretch on the whole middle five octaves of the piano. It works really, really well. It works out nice and even. So the, those those octave tuning styles are still there. They still work. Um, if you're tuning, if you're practicing for the tuning exam, we have a OTS E um, that's um, it's it's going to be really clean octaves, and it's going to be super 
between single octaves right up all sort of halfway between the single octave and the double octave in the seventh yeah, octave it still has a little stretch but hardly any and it's going to help you listen to what examiners want to hear in, in the exam room. Could you show how to use the cybersecurity practice the oral. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't, why don't you show them how to do a mock exam, Dean? Sure. I can't go through the whole thing because we need a lot more time, but I can give you the I can give you the clip notes. Okay. So, so um, the first thing you want to do is to go and um, create an exam tuning. Go to files, tunings, files, and the plus at the bottom means adding something, creating a new one. We're going to call it um, my exam. And you gotta, you've got to click the exam button so it knows to save it as an exam. Which saves different partials. The exam yeah. mode has different it, partials. It creates, actually, um, it creates eight tuning records that are all set up to do the exam. They're set. You can't, change, um, you can't change the order of these, but you don't want to or need to. Okay? So the examinee is, the, most folks want to learn to tune orally. They want to pass the, the hard part is to pass the, the, the uh, two octaves, part one. Uh, oral exam. You got to tune 25 notes from C3 to B4, 24 notes, uh, and you got to tune them by ear. You get no machine. The rest of the exam, you get to use your machine. Easy peasy, no problem. You should be able to pass it uh, way over 80 percent without a problem. You just tune it right to your machine. This is the hard part that you need to practice for. So, what problem is you don't have a master tuning. Well, yes, you do. If you sample this piano, um, CyberTuner will calculate. Uh, a tuning that's close enough, it's not a master tuning, but it's close enough to a master tuning that if you can tune really well against the cyber tuner calculated tuning, you'll and do and pass uh, that part, the part one against the cyber tuner tuning, you'll be able to pass the, the, uh, the actual tuning exam by ear also. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have any trouble. Uh, the, the and it scores you, just like you can now, you can tune those 25 notes, it'll give you a score just like you took your exam. You can see where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and it does more than that. It tells you how to improve your tuning, what intervals to play. Actually, I, I can't. I can show you. I'll show you that part right just now. So, but you want to you want to put this Kelly Wheeling tuning into the exam tuning. So all we do is hit calculate. Um, we don't want OTSP though. You don't want to. You don't want to practice against. It isn't, isn't a big difference, but I would I would recommend E OTSE a classic OTSE for exam. Hit done. Now we're at OTSE. Hit calculate. Um, tune, and and it's going to tell you. Oh, okay. You're in the exam mode. It puts it puts this tuning into the examinee, um, both one part one and two, and in the master. So we're all set up. We have all the same partials. CyberTuner doesn't use the same partials as the exam. It uses higher partials because it's uh, exam uh, for technical reasons. We don't want to cover that. So you just mute the left string and test yourself on that. You, um, I would get the, a temperament strip and mute the whole mute the whole piano off so you don't have anything ringing on you. And, but mainly, you need to mute, mute the mid range. Okay, but you, mute the whole mute as much of the piano as you can with temperament strip. Yeah, you would have taken your samples, calculated the tuning for this piano, and then. You dump, it dumps that tuning. I don't know if he knows. Oh, he wants to. Do, he wants to test himself for the exam, or he wants to take the exam. Um, it puts that tuning into the exam in the <laughs> correct places in the exam. So the next thing we want to do, we're starting out at exam E one. Um, it's already got its own. If you test, if you per, if you uh, scored it right now, you get hundred percent. Sorry, sorry, that's not going to work. So we're going to take it down, and we're going to put an error into um, note C four. Okay. And and we're gonna we're gonna move it up. Uh, let's say I just moved it up. I saved the sense. So let's look at let's look at a graph of that. Can we just record something and see how far that is? Um, examine and this looks like I recorded that note. Let's go back to tune. Oops, we're going to reset to 440. Um, trying to get C4. So that's basically how you record yourself. Um, 
once you've tuned the piano, the whole mid-range of the piano, you're going to play each note and you're going to save it. I'm hitting save button right there. Okay. So, and it goes to the next note, you can record the next note. In about five minutes, you can record your oral tuning. Let's say I did that. I just, I just recorded a really bad note in here so they can have something to score me against, okay? And we're going we're gonna to stop it and we're going to go to RPT exam mode and we're going to score. Now, it's warning us. There's a red right there. It says unofficial practice partials. If you're in a real exam room and you see that, like the examiners are using this, or you're using this in the exam room, don't do this. This is not an official exam because it's the wrong partial. The, the exam has to be used, has to use 421 partials. But it's, it's still a valid test of your oral tuning ability. It's actually a better test in this case. So we're going to hit, and you can put in what temperament you used. If, you're, if you use a big, wide, a two active temperament, just let, leave F3 on there. You're better off. So I'm going to hit score part one. And it takes us, oh, there's a, there's a five point error. Because I, I recorded a note there that was, I knew was off. So, <clears throat> did, so the question is, did we pass? Oh my goodness, we just barely, we, we did pass. Because we only had one error in the temperament. Um, we're going to go back to the chart. So the question is, is this, the question is, what, what's wrong with that note? So if we're oral tuners, we can tell. But if we want the program to tell us what is wrong with that note, we tap on it and go or, to choose oral tutor. And here, the, I'm not sure what happened there. We got a blackout on the screen. Because it doesn't have the other notes recorded. No, no, it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, this is a new ver beta version, and we haven't tested the, the, the exam portion of it. So normally it would have a keyboard in this part, and um, the keyboard the keyboard points to it. Uh, oh, it would have text on, up there, sorry. It has text up there, and it tells you. This is embarrassing that we have a bug. Uh, we have text up there, and the text is blacked out because it's a new version with a new compiler. So we're still testing this. We go through, test everything before this is released. So um, I could just load on the, the version off the App Store and show you, but I'm yeah. not going to bother doing it. The, the point is, it'll help you, teach you how to tune. And we're going to now take AI and take what it learns from the AI and feed this into the exam, mock exam. And we're going to use this so that you can better prepare to take your tuning exam. We're going to integrate all of these features. It's going to become even easier. So what this is showing you on your, your, you won't see this black bar in your version. It's going to show you the worst interval at the very top, and it's going to tell you what the problem is and what the solution is, and that you need to move that. That's that note is way, way sharp, and you need to move that flat. And the best interval for detecting that is the contiguous thirds. Two major thirds should be at four, four to five ratio. I can't show you that on, on this because it's not tuned to that, but. Um, that's the gist of it. It's going to show you, and you can go through every one of those notes that are off that had points. Just look at the biggest ones, and it'll tell you which oral intervals are, the, are a problem and which ones to check and how to correct it. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Can you uh, kind of tell us what you do? You use that smart tuning and uh, compare that to how the Tune Lab does that with the overpull. Okay, so, so Tune Lab is doing a gross overpull connection. In other words, they're overpulling, let's say, by uh, a fourth, a fifth in the base, and a fourth in the mid-range, and a third at the top. Okay? Something like that. Those are the overpulls. We use a different overpull on every note. Let's say on B2, we might be overpulling by uh, 16 percent, and on C3 by 17 percent, and on C sharp, by 28%. It's a different amount for every note. So instead of just kind of getting close by doing a pitch raise, and then it settles, and it settles pretty good, you do a first pass, and then you do a second pass. Because our overpulls are so unique for the piano, for the size piano, for, for the range of, of, of your overshooting, every note will settle exactly to where you want it to be. So your first pass isn't a, a pitch raise approximation of the tuning. It'll settle to exactly the right tuning. That's Tune Lab, Veritune, AccuTuner, none of them do that. We're the only ones who do that. So you're 
Every note. Every every note as yes, every note is being measured and sampled when you're in smart tune mode. And then when you say it can it knows those different types of pianos, do you have to select it's a small grand? No. It Cybertuner is smart enough to know whether it's a small console or a terrible grand, whether it's a, a, a full-size upright, whether it's a, a, a regular grand, whether it's a 7-foot grand, or whether it's a 12-foot grand. Based, off of the samples. Based on the samples that you did. It, yep. and, and the tuning that it created, it looks internally and it knows the size of the piano. It does generally, but it, there is a question at the beginning, it, it, after you sample with Chameleon sometimes, where it asks you the piano size. If the piano is really well scaled, It'll actually ask you how big it is, and that helps it out a little bit. Right. But generally, it knows already. It, look at, it looks at the inharmonicity on A2, and, and if the inharmonicity on that note is really good, then it's a really, it could be a C3, it could be a C7, it could be a CF. You have to tell it whether it's six feet, seven feet, or nine feet. So this is just an example. Um, I'm in pitch raise, I'm in smart tune mode, and the program is, it's showing us our over pull right up here, percentage. Uh, my, my, my pointer here is kind of finicky. The percentage, the amount that it's over pulling, and the original, it's recorded the original sense. It records the original sense on every note as you go up the piano, um, and then it's going to over pull by a specific amount. And that specific amount is based on not just the over pull for this note, but it's a, it's a moving average and a weighted average for this note and the previous six notes. So that way it can get the, if you have an outlier, uh, a note is way sharp or way flat, it's not going to, it's not going to change the overpull that much, a little bit. But, um, and that's, it, you know, all those things combined and using a little bit of probability is able to get the, the program so that within a, within a 20, if the piano's within a 20 cent range, you're going to end up with a one pass tuning with maybe two minutes of touch up at the most. So, um, and I wouldn't spend more than two minutes touching up a few unisons, and it's going to be great. Yes. Well, what, the reason you do that is when you look at where the struts are and you look at where the change from copper to plain is, the pre, you're, you're, you're having pre-drop. As you go up, you're kind of crushing the, the soundboard bridge and the notes ahead of you are falling. And when you go past them, you're crushing the bridge ahead and they're falling some more. And it's very predictable. We've got a very good empirical model. But when you have a strut, there's a void on the bridge underneath it. There's no strings there. So as you come close to those struts, the pre-drop and the post-drop is a little different than it is for all the other notes. And so we're alerting CyberTuner that there's a void coming up and you need to take that into account. And these are the type of little tweaks that we're putting that allow us to do one pass pitch corrections. Nobody else is giving the, the machine this type of information. By giving it this type of information, we can tune it in one pass and have it be really close. This, this is the interface right here. Um, you're telling Stiper Tuner basically where the break, bass treble break is, where the lowest plain wire note is, which is right here on this piano, where this strut is and where this strut is. And those are the places where the, where the overpulls need to change a little bit from, from just a smooth curve. And so once it knows all that information, it's, it's can much better um, overpull. And it only takes, you know, 30, 20, 30 seconds to put that info in. Uh, and if you, once you've done it once, if you go back to this tuning record the next time, it remembers that, and then you're all set. You don't have to do it again. It's a good question. Yes. So um, with the, when the AI mode comes out, Let's say you've been tuning somebody's piano and you know, you've got this in the, the machine. So next time you go out to tune, the, tune their piano, would you? I would, I would probably resample it, but you don't have to. If you want to pull up a record that already exists and then put it in AI mode, you can now do the AI measuring on top of that, and it'll correct that tuning that you've already been using. Okay, that's what I mean. So you, you pull up the, the record that you already have and just tune that, those 25 notes. Exactly. Pre precisely. Yeah, you don't have to resample the whole piano if you don't want to. It'll use an older, an older tuning record that you, um, you pulled in. We've actually changed the tuning file format uh, so it has more data storage, um, but it, the program will automatically upgrade your, your tuning files to the new format whenever you open them. So listen, um, I, I thank, thank you all for coming. Please fill out a, a blue form for all of us, otherwise they won't have us back. But uh, 
and, and we really appreciate your coming to the class.